um, the entire world is currently facing um, a climate crisis, and there has never been a more urgent need to discuss climate change. Um, throughout the day, of course, we will be uh, conducting some very focused sessions uh, on circular economics and uh, alternative um, energy solutions. And uh, we will be having uh, some context setting that's going to be set by my colleague Venkat. Then we'll also have a keynote speech by Mr. Oliver. Um, and then, of course, we're going to have the panel discussion, which uh, is going to be very, uh, very interesting, very interactive as well. Um, yeah, so let's look out for that. So um, I'd like to welcome Anita, our very able, very fabulous uh, moderator. <laughs> I've run out of them. <laughs> yeah, to take it over from there. Thank you. Oh, DJ, that song came too late. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Well, you know how it is with me. If you don't talk back, we will be here all night. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. You know, you should be excited because the concept of you being in this room means that the future of the continent on which we are, and most likely the entire world, sits in your palms. And what I mean by that is each and every one of you, regardless of the industry that you represent, each and every one of you has a specific role to play in making the world a better place. Today we're focusing on the circular economy, where we take waste and we make it valuable all over again. We've got plastics in front of us. We've got all sorts of materials that we take for granted on a daily basis. But my colleague William mentioned something so important, climate change. Where do our issues come from? It comes from the fact that we take one material and it has only one use. How do we make the world a better place? By taking all these materials and giving them a new life moving from a linear economy to a circular economy. And that's what today's or this morning's conversation is going to be primarily about. Before I bring Venkat onto the stage to set the context, imagine the idea that the circular economy represents an unprecedented, urgent 4.5 trillion global business opportunity. Imagine that. So clearly, there is an urgency. Let's start off by setting the context for what this urgency is, and by listening to the contributions of the government, private sector, and major players across the continent and around the world, and what the urgencies are, and why those of us in this room and beyond, those of us watching us online, need to make our efforts a lot more urgent. Ladies and gentlemen, I like to think I'm a powerful person, but I don't have the kind of power Venkat has. So please give him a round of applause as he comes on stage to set the context for the morning's program. And if you don't know Venkat, Venkat, you've got to dance onto the stage. He's the director in Telecap. And of course, <laughs> I'm keeping him in Ghana so I can teach him some moves. Ladies and gentlemen, Venkat is here to start the day. Go ahead. She's always a tough act to follow, isn't it? Okay. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Venkat, uh, and I have the pleasure and privilege of serving IntelliCap as its director and partner. Um, I specifically lead two mandates at IntelliCap. One is, please stop me if I tend to move around and away from the mic, but I lead climate solutions and I lead circular economy solutions uh, for IntelliCap across the global south. When I refer to global south in general, I'm referring to three geographical clusters, which is the South Asia, Southeast Asia, and of course, Africa, which is where we are. Um, so I think we've spoken about it a little bit um, yesterday where, okay. We spoke about it a little bit yesterday about IntelliCap's journey over the last two decades, right? So we've built uh, a lot of experience, we've gathered a lot of experience and expertise in building ecosystems. And the importance of ecosystems is that it lays the foundation for each one of us in this room, whether we are an entrepreneur, we are a policy actor, whether we are an investor or a funder, we are a foundation, we are an ecosystem builder like ourselves. Um, so think of Silicon Valley. The reason why the tech boom that has happened in the last 15, 20 years is because there's an ecosystem. The capital providers, the knowledge providers, the incubators and accelerators and so on and so forth. 
So that support ecosystem is really important for each one of us to thrive, not at a scale of one or a unit of one, but at a unit of an economy or an ecosystem. Um, 2017, um, we took a step back and we said, look, all the work that we've been doing in uh, building the ecosystems across different sectors like climate, clean energy, agriculture, natural resources, gender and livelihoods, care economy, inclusive financial solutions, if you really need to make a significant impact and justify the reason why we exist towards the 2030 SDGs, what is the single biggest opportunity we have to address the three existential challenges that the planet is facing, right? We set up um, a very specific initiative called Circular Apparel Innovation Factory. Um, and very simply, our purpose or reason to exist is that we want to help the fashion industry or the textiles and garments industry, which is the third most polluting sector globally, and Africa is unfortunately one of those uh, areas which has been at the negative receiving end of the impact that the fashion value chain globally has. Um, but every single thing that we do, our thinking and our work, has to address two fundamental questions that we ask ourselves, which is the program that we're going to put together, the ecosystem that we are building, is it going to make circularity within reach for every single individual, community, stakeholder in the value chain? And two, does it make it participatory? I think one of the conversations that uh, happened in the panel yesterday was about how do we make sure that no one is left behind, right? So, uh, and I think one of my fellow panelists later in the day uh, rightly pointed out, it's very easy to point fingers at somebody, whether it's a corporate or a brand or a manufacturer, and saying, you're doing something wrong. But it takes uh, a very ambitious and a very progressive outlook to get up and say, what can I do to make sure that they can participate in the circular economy? Because the moment you have one individual, one stakeholder left out, then there is no circular economy. Couple of points. Um, this is true for fashion, but also true for a lot of sectors. There's a lot of thrust that goes in making sure that we transition to renewable energy or clean energy. But broadly speaking, and these are very broad brushstrokes and we can get down to specifics on the sector level, but even if we move 100% to renewable energy, we phase out coal from the fashion industry globally, we would still, still fall short of the climate emissions by 45 to 50%, right? The single biggest opportunity for us to bridge that gap is on circular economy. And that's the bet that we put uh, six years, seven years back. And we started with the fundamental philosophy that if we need to make circular economy scaled, we shift circular economy from the margins to the mainstream, then we need to make sure that we're not just addressing the economics of it or the environmental aspects of it, but we need to make sure that it is inclusive and participatory, right? Um, second data point. We are the third largest, uh, most polluting sector. The raw materials that go into the fashion industry come from three fundamental sectors, farms, forests, and fossil fuels. And two of those three are the number one and number two most polluting sectors, agriculture and petroleum industry, or fossil fuels, right? So it's ridiculous that you have the top two most polluting sectors, which adds as an input to the third most polluting sector. So if you want to think about circular economy, you need to think about beyond the construct of how we define one sector, right? We're going to speak about electronics and plastics and textiles and everything else, built environment, food value chains, agriculture value chains. So you need to think of circular economy in the construct of everything put together. Because that's real circular economy. When the output from one sector can become an input for the other sector, that's when we're giving a new life to materials. Three existential challenges that all of us here are trying to solve for. And everything is an offshoot of these three. The climate emergency, loss of nature or degradation of biodiversity, and the third one is inequality. Inequality, everything from gender inequality to access to food, access to universal services, um, everything, water, sanitation, hygiene, all those aspects, right? The single biggest opportunity or a set of solutions or a set of framework that can actually address all these three is circular economy. 
And the reason I'm highlighting circular economy is because the, the panel discussions that we'll have later on as well, there's a significant relevance for circular economy in what we're doing in West Africa and for, of course, East Africa as well, right? Um, just to give you a sense of when we say we build ecosystems, and this is the last point, and I'll take a stop after this, is you look at everyone from the farmer on one side of the spectrum who is growing the raw material, think of cotton or any other material, to the policy actors on the other end and everyone in between, the brands, the manufacturers, the SMEs, the innovators, the startups, the solution providers, the workers, the waste workers, the informal workers, the self-help groups, right? The home-based garment workers, everyone. And this is not just true for fashion as a sector or textiles and garment as a sector, but that's true for plastics, that's true for electronics, that's true for the built environments uh, value chain as well, right? So I want you to think of ecosystem as you have conversations later on and as you think of question on or ask yourself on how you can play value or add to the narrative in scaling circular economy, I want you to think of how can we do these? How can we create a platform for pre-competitive collaboration where the so-called competitors can come together? How can we build a community that looks at the same goal and the same outcomes? How can we make sure that we are democratizing knowledge? One of the values that we have and we hold ourselves uh, true to every single day is making sure that every single program we have, we share the knowledge and the learnings from that backwards, right? So think of the ecosystem and how each of these four components can actually come together. I spoke about it briefly yesterday as well. Convergence of capital, knowledge, networks, and technology, right? So just wanted to share a broad context of what we do. I can get into specifics, but uh, I would rather make more time for the wonderful panel uh, panelists that are gonna come on board uh, very soon. But uh, thank you so much, and happy to have conversations on how we can work together to scale circular economy and realize the opportunity that it represents for West Africa and individually Ghana and all the other countries as well. Thank you so much and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Venkat, thank you very much for laying the foundation for the conversation this morning. Now, Venkat talks about opportunities. He talks about a plethora of industries that can benefit from strategy. But what's the point of having a strategy without government support, without the right kind of policies to plug into? The essence of the, the conversation this morning is to talk about how all these areas, these essential areas are connected. So we're very happy to have a representative, a very able-minded and very able, uh, um, what I'd say, experienced individual to take us through government's perspective in the person of the senior advisor to the Minister of Environment, Science, Technology, and Innovation. Please make welcome the honorable, I like to call him honorable, Tommy Oliver Boachi. Uh, thank you very much. Mr. Venkat Kotomaraju of Intellicap, Mr. Sidat Lula, the principal at Intellicap, Mr. Ashok. Taniconda, manager at Intellicap, Ms. Enam Beko, team lead, Sankarp, West Africa, and Ms. Ariel Molino, team lead of Sankarp, Africa. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to join Intellicap and the organizers of the SANCAP West Africa Summit to welcome all of you to the second day of this exciting event. It is my greatest pleasure to say Akwaba to all of you, especially those who have come from other countries to participate in this event. I'd also like to thank the organizers for inviting me and granting me the opportunity to deliver this keynote address. I'm very honored indeed. The theme for the Sankap West Africa Summit is Circular Horizons, Exploring 
a sustainable future of West Africa's economy and has the key objectives of one, understanding the circular economy priorities, the challenges and opportunities in Western Africa and Africa as a whole, creating the grounds for the partnerships that are required to address the gaps, and supporting the development of priorities of the region through a circular economy lens. To help us in identifying the areas of alignment and the entry points for partnerships and collaboration, I intend to use the next few minutes to address the question, why is Africa going circular? To highlight the steps that Ghana is taking together with our colleague African countries in that regard, and what is left to be done in order to achieve a just transition. Circular economy is crucial for achieving Africa's policy priorities. Rapid population growth, irresponsible resource exploitation, and uncontrolled production and consumption have combined with climate change to mount intense pressure on the world's resources such as land, water, forests, minerals, and energy. Desertification, deforestation, illegal mining, and soil erosion are all increasing at alarming rates, especially in Africa and other developing regions. And as a result, precious resources from fertile soil to freshwater streams are rapidly diminishing, while the demand for basic resources such as land and water grows for households, agriculture, and industrial users. There's a great deal of evidence of this in Ghana and many countries in Africa that these are having devastating impacts on populations around the world, particularly on the poor who rely on these resources to generate most of their incomes and maintain their subsistence. The world's current economic system is based on linear principles of extracting natural resources, using them up, and discarding the remains to create huge volumes of waste as a result. The rate of use of resources based on this linear model has tripled over the last half decade and could double again by 2060 if the world continues business as usual. Despite advances in technology, the growth rate in material consumption continues to increase faster than population growth, with many social and environmental impacts resulting from inequities in consumption and production. Not only is this layer model unsustainable, the economic impacts of COVID-19 have shown how vulnerable we are to economic shocks resulting from any disruption in the current flow of resources. Indeed, it is very safe to say that the world stands at the risk of failing to achieve the sustainable development goals within the target deadline of 2020 if we continue on this trajectory. The good news is that by working towards a circular economy, we can transition to a system that is designed to prevent waste and pollution keep products and materials in longer use, and regenerate the natural systems that lead to a more resilient world economy. And that is why Ghana has made a firm decision to transition to circular economy. Our vision is to incrementally transform the country's economy into a climate resilient, low carbon, sustainable, and inclusive system that creates value from retaining resources and eliminating waste and pollution. 
you may know that there is a direct linkage between secularity and the SDGs and the climate goals. And that is why we believe that this linkage will enable Ghana to accelerate its socioeconomic development and climate change mitigation actions. In 2016, a law was passed known as Act 917 to govern the control and management of hazardous and electronic waste in Ghana. Act 917 is based firmly on the principles and practices of secular economy. In 2018, Ghana's National Plastics Management Policy was released and was finally approved by cabinet in 2020. The National Plastics Management Policy is also based firmly on the principles of circular economy. And it is very interesting to note that it has spawned off an exciting array of programs at the national, regional, and global levels. At the national level, the policy has enabled us to secure a grant from the Global Environment Facility, or GEF, to establish a circular economic framework for plastics in Ghana. While this project is very significant on its own, it has spawned off another project funded by the Government of Canada through the Global Affairs Canada to establish the Ghana Circular Economy Center, which is designed as a center of excellence for circular economy in the country and to serve as a model for other countries in the Africa region. At the same time, the World Bank, through its ProBlue Trust Fund, has provided a grant for Ghana to develop and operate an extended producer responsibility or EPR scheme for Ghana, a scheme that will eventually be scaled to cover other material streams such as electronics, textiles, food systems, and the built environment or the construction industry. Other components of the ProBlue support project will enable us to strengthen our legal and regulatory framework, provide infrastructure for effective management of plastic waste, provide education, awareness creation, and community engagement, and to foster an accelerated integration of the informal sector into the plastics value chain. At the regional level, Ghana is a member of the Africa Circular Economy Alliance. The alliance was conceived at the World Economic Forum in Kigali in 2016 and was launched at COP23 in Bonn, Germany. It was founded by three countries, Rwanda, Nigeria, and South Africa, along with UN and the UN Environment Program and the World Economic Forum. The Alliance has since grown in size to include Ghana and about eight other countries, and is supported by the Africa Development Bank, the Global Environment Facility, the Government of Finland, the European Commission, the United Nations Environment Program, and the World Economic Forum. The ambition of the Africa Secular Economy Alliance is to spare Africa's transformation to a secular economy that delivers economic growth, create decent jobs, and deliver positive environmental outcomes at the national, regional, and continental levels. The current areas of focus for the alliance include plastics, electronic waste, food systems, textiles, and the built environment. And also at the continental level, the Africa Union has just recently commissioned the Continental Circular Economy Action Plan, which aims to identify potential opportunities and constraints in adopting a circular economy approach on the continent and developing a circular economy action plan for Africa. 
under the initiative, there are ongoing consultations with relevant continental, regional, and national stakeholders on actions that are needed for Africa to transition to circular economy. This project is being funded by the European Union. Ghana has also been actively engaged in the negotiations that are currently ongoing under the United Nations Environment Assembly, or UNEA, which is aimed at ending plastic pollution, including in the marine environment. By promoting circular economic practices throughout the full life cycle of plastics. In relation to this, Ghana has actually proposed the Global Plastics Pollution Fee as a funding mechanism to finance the implementation of this global treaty. The GPPF, as we call it, will mobilize funds from polymer and virgin plastic polluters or producers on the basis of the polluter pays principle and apply the funds towards the provision of waste management infrastructure for all countries, including our own, in order to achieve circular economic goals in the global plastics industry. In order to accelerate Ghana's transition to circular economy, we identified the need to develop a circular economy roadmap to guide us. It is also meant to create a strong alignment among policymakers, the business community, the investment community, the informal sector, academia, and civil society on the vision, goals, and actions that are needed to achieve more security in Ghana's economy and its priority sectors. In this way, the circular economy roadmap and action plan serves to encourage stakeholders' involvement and sparks inspiration for innovation and collaboration, which are vital for the long-term and sustainable success. While there has been significant interest in circular economic models, investments and scale are not happening fast enough. Therefore, there's a need to bring leaders together and create alignment among them to show the way forward. Governments can set policies. Government can set policies. Companies can adapt their business models. The finance sector can invest. Researchers can provide a scientific backing and the individuals can also do their best. But the biggest challenge is getting these stakeholders to work together and to support the creation of space for collaboration among them so that new solutions can be identified and what works can be scaled up. In concluding, other challenges that confront the transition to circular economy include lack of strong policy standards and regulations, the need for education, awareness creation, and community engagement, and lack of technology and innovation. If you are able to overcome these challenges in Africa and succeed in achieving a just transition to circular economy, many jobs will be created along the value chains of all sectors in both developed and developing countries will be more so in developing countries and largely among those in the vulnerable segments of our societies. I have a very strong conviction that the entry of IntelliCAP into the West Africa region through the SENCAP West Africa Summit marks the beginning of the kind of partnerships and initiatives that will ultimately help Ghana and Africa to achieve the just transition. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Um, if I may call you, Oliver, please take a seat so you don't have to go down the stairs and come back up. So we've got 20 minutes 
to conceptualize and put all of this into a reality, into a real plan, a real strategy, and draw that fine line that sits right across policymakers, implementers, and associations that guide and guard the concept of the circular economy. So of course, we already have uh, Mr. Boache here. I'll call him Oliver for the purpose of the conversation. And also, please welcome to the stage environmental sanitation consultant, Ms. Abina Isumeni. Please, a round of applause, the Ghana way. We learned this yesterday. Come on, guys. May we also have from the Ghana National Plastic Action, Mr. Kwame Asamwa Mensa. Of course, we saw Venkat earlier on. I can't have this conversation without him. Venkat, please come up on stage. I'll bring you back. And in the next 18 minutes, I'll ask each one of them only one question because I know that the workshops and the breakout sessions are just about to begin. Hello. Fantastic. Good morning, lady and gentlemen. Are you doing this because yesterday the women outnumbered the men? So now the men outnumber the women. Very unintentional. All right. Let's have this conversation very quickly. Mr. Boache, because you just spoke, I'm just going to start off with you. You mentioned something extremely crucial, which is that transitioning to a circular economy is priority, and you referenced the SDGs, and of course the fact that we're only a few years away from 2030. So it is most urgent than ever. Sankalp has highlighted the power of collaborations and partnerships. What is required on the government side to ensure that you are, or collectively, we are able to meet this quote-unquote deadline, which you mentioned in your keynote. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, also, in the keynote, if you recall, I mentioned uh, the policy initiatives that we have taken and the fact that we've decided that from now on, everything we do in the management of our resources are going to be based firmly on the principles and practices of circularity. That is why we are creating a framework for uh, plastics uh, uh, circular economy in Ghana. That's a project that is already ongoing. Uh, we, within this project, we are supporting about 14 small and medium-sized enterprises that operate within the plastic value chain, uh, both financially and technically, for them to be able to scale up uh, their, their businesses. We are also uh, creating this center of excellence in Ghana, uh, which is not just for plastics, but also for all the other uh, sectors that we have talked about. And we believe that by creating this enabling environment and making it possible for both the private sector and uh, NGOs and other civil society organizations to operate, we are going to um, foster uh, the path that will enable us to achieve the objectives of the SDGs. Fantastic. Kwame, this must be great news to your ears as you develop the kinds of models that can help us you know, accelerate the management and the creation of a circular economy. From the perspective of Ghana National Plastic Action, can you describe um, some of these models? I think I'm audible now. Okay, great. So from the National Plastic Action Partnership, the main goal is to create that collaboration between stakeholders. And I think we've talked about it in the context setting, the importance of collaboration amongst the different stakeholders in the, in the country. And so the National Plastic Action Partnership brings together the public, the private, civil society, international organizations in this way. And we are organized across six different tax forces or six different thematic areas. One of them is policy, which Mr. Bache did talk about, and Ghana looking at an EPR 
scheme in Ghana. But we must understand that if we're going to have an EPI scheme, it should be something that is designed for the Ghanaian context. And so what the platform does is to bring together members of the platform to inform the development of the EPR scheme in a way that is inclusive and fix the Ghanaian context. Again, another issue we've talked about is the issue of awareness and behavior change. And here we are also bringing together the partners to come up with a stakeholder engagement campaign that focuses on reduction and reuse. Right, so encouraging people to reduce their consumption of plastics, encouraging people to also adapt reuse methods, which also contributes to the circular economy. And then finally, also on the issue of innovation. And here, there are a number of exciting initiatives by different partners on the NPAP. People converting plastics into pavement blocks, using it in infrastructure, people collecting, leveraging technology to connect to collect all these, how can we begin to create visibility on some of these modules for people to see? And there are a number of ways that the NPAP platform is doing it. So coming up with reports that highlights that, bringing together the partners and having people come to showcase what they are doing. For example, I, I just uh, will end quickly. The, uh, in the past two weeks, we had a, a meeting of the Innovation Tax Force where we had some of these innovators come to showcase what they are doing. And it was interesting for partners to know that, okay, for example, if now I want to order food from a restaurant, there are ways where I can adopt sustainable packaging in terms of ordering food. So that is the way that, that the platform is enabling collaboration and also supporting models. Thank you very much, Kwame. Uh, you know, I like to say at Sanka, we believe in practicalizing all these wonderful um, initiatives and strategies that are being described. And that, that's why I'm particularly happy that Abna is here. Abna, let's put this into practical sense. From where you sit as a consultant, surely you have seen a lot of these ideas being practicalized on the ground. Can you share some of those um, examples with us? Um, right. Um, thank you. What um, I can say, I, I can speak from the experiential point of view, where we are working, and I represent the Just One group of companies, which is the biggest conglomerate um, in the West space, in West Africa, actually. And that means that in terms of even the business strategy and business model, we have kept circular economy in mind. Um, and I'll give you practical examples. We have subsidiaries that are focused on collecting waste from the environment, and at that stage, we do um, waste separation. Then there's another company that does um, recycling. Then there's another company that is doing research, and that's where, where I come in. So for instance, um, we are thinking, if we are part of the NPAP, where we contribute in terms of research. And on the practical level, some of the things we are doing are not only supporting with accurate data from the ground, because we must use data um, to give to the partnerships and also to influence policy. And so we sit at a very strategic place. And one of the things that we are doing, for instance, is the collection or the usage of plastics collected and using a, a method called pyrolysis turning plastics into um, fuel, which can be used by industries. And so we are doing several other things. We are partnering to even collect data on different types of plastics from different regions. Because um, as part of the NPAP and also being part of the Just One group of companies, what we are realizing is that there's so much talk about plastics, but no data to back decision making. And for the business ecosystem, you cannot make any relevant decision without accurate data. And so that's, these are some of the things we are coming in. But critically also with uh, regards to the behavioral change, we have come up um, with um, an advocacy TV program, which we call Trash Talk. Uh, initially, when we were talking about the name, <laughs> we thought it was very funny. But we said, really, we are talking about trash, you know? And so we, talk, we should talk about everything. And in that space, we've invited the ministry, for instance, we have other partners who have come on board, and we are talking about audience, not only, because who is reading the research we are conducting? Unless a, a panel or a group like this. But the people who are actually creating the irresponsible dumping are the people out there who are not reading. And so we create, we come also from the angle of advocacy, where we are showing them how things can be done better, 
how responsible behaviors can come on, on board. Um, one critical thing and final point is, for instance, we've realized that we can talk about plastics all we want if we don't even address the issue of segregation from the household level. Yeah. Let me keep you on your microphone, Apina. You mentioned the word skill, and in my mind, the space between you know, perhaps even the policy and the implementation is skill. Where and how do you provide opportunities for the right individuals or organizations to have the right skills uh, to accelerate your strategy? Um, wonderful. Um, as part of the agreements we have, we do send, sign a lot of agreements with um, academic institutions, for instance, because in trying to get the right information out there, it's about skills training. So we try, we have um, a, a, a training out, outlet which is called ASWAM. Um, there we are training people from the skills, from the industry, and also going all the way down to advocacy. Um, what we've realized is that sometimes people are not doing the, the wrong thing just because they, they are happy doing the wrong thing they sometimes just don't know what right thing to do. And so we are partnering with institutions. Um, and Amest, for instance, recently signed an agreement with GAEC, which is one of the agencies under um, Ministry of Environment, Science, Technology, and Innovation. And they have a, a machine that looks into plastics, microplastic. And so we thought that as a research outfit, we must now not only talk about the tangible plastics we have out there, but we should get into the harmful aspects of, for instance, burning. Burning, which is also one way of disposal in um, our ecosystem or in Ghana. And it's, it's an interesting mix, but as the SDG has pointed out to, and as MPAP is doing, we cannot do without partnerships in this circular economy space that we find ourselves. Because somebody's output is somebody's input. And that's the only way we can ensure sustainability. Venkat, so automatically, your ears will start to twitch. We cannot do without partnerships. And from the perspective of Sankal, looking at this ecosystem, what, how can we move? How can we accelerate uh, these collaborations? And in so being, be efficient in our acceleration, so to speak. Sure. Um, I think the collaboration, as much as it's difficult to initiate collaborations and being open to partnerships, um, I think the fundamental thing that is required for collaborations to start happening is for two individuals, two organizations to agree on a common outcome. Mm -hmm. There has to be first an understanding and an articulation of what is the problem that needs to be solved, right? Because unless you have that convergence in thinking, um, you're bound to go in two different directions, right? So articulating that one common problem that needs to be solved. Second is um, no matter who we are, whether we are on the government side, whether we are uh, in industry associations, whether ecosystem builders, corporates, um, we're all human beings. So if you want to humanize the problem, um, the first thing that, and I think one of the things that we tackle on a day-to-day -day basis, and that's part of those two questions that I said we ask ourselves, is um, we're all human beings, which means whether consciously or subconsciously, and most often, subconsciously, every single time we are having a conversation, if I'm having a conversation with Kwame or uh, Oliver, I'm subconsciously asking, what's in it for me? What do I get out of it, right? Which means that goes back to the point that one of the panelists yesterday said about making it inclusive and participatory. So it's absolutely critical for us is to have a very clear roadmap, starting with a common objective, common agenda, common problem to solve and have a clear framework which solves for every single individual. There are only two fundamental reasons, and this is my last point, is two reasons why circular economy is not scaling anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world. There are, um, quite, there's quite a sufficient and credible uh, use cases that's coming out of Scandinavia. They're definitely ahead of the curve uh, compared to the rest of the regions. 
But even there, it's working on a scale of one or a unit of one in one city, one region, or one specific aspect of a sector, not even the entire sector. The two reasons are, one, the unit economics need to work. Recycling is a very small part of circular economy, very, very small part. Eventually, for circular economy to work, the material has to come back into the economy, right? That means the unit economics need to work. Today, anywhere in the world, the n narrative and the data that's available, the evidence that's available says that recycled, sustainable alternatives are far more expensive as compared to the virgin material, which means it'll always be difficult for brands, the upstream producers or the uh, midstream users or the customers will always find it difficult to adopt them. So which means unit economics need to work. And the second one is the reverse logistics doesn't exist. Bringing that whole aspect of that value chain that needs to come together, which means that the reality is there's no one individual, one organization, one government, one entity which will have all the knowledge, the bandwidth, resources to solve this problem. There is no way out, I promise you, there's no way out but for complementary skills and wisdom to come together, agree on a common problem, and move forward on a common pathway. It has to be co-created. Thank you very much, Venkat. With a room filled with a plethora of industrialists, a plethora of, of personalities from different um, aspects of our economy, so to speak, with four and a few minutes left, I'm going to ask each and every one of you to give us a call to action from your perspective, because ultimately today we are leaving with calls to action so that next year we can record the kind of progress we made from those calls to action. Kwame, what would your call to action be? Great, I think I will talk about the need for us to decentralize this information around the circular economy. And from some of the studies that we've done, one of the things we've realized is that number one, for example, if you, even if you look at the financial sector, there needs to be that understanding around the nuances in even investing in the circular economy. Even when it comes to people identifying the opportunities that the circular economy brings, People don't, most people don't have that information. So one thing that we can do from here with all the information that we've, we've had is how can we decentralize that information to other people to also understand the opportunities and how they can also support in enabling the circular economy as we've talked about collaboration be a key uh, factor. Thank you. Abena, what about you? Um, I'll come from the point of view of speaking from a place of evidence and that means that we need to get the data on circular economy. Sometimes we are throwing around the circular economy um, topic or theme, and it seems so high level. We must now deconstruct, and each angle of it must be investigated properly yes. so that we can share the responsibility and be held accountable. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I think that is about evidence-based decision-making, and that stems from research. Thank you, and what about you, Oliver? Well, uh, first of all, I think we need to recognize that every one of us, whether uh, as individuals or institutions, uh, politicians or, or policymakers and so on, everyone has a role to play in uh, making sure that we have a just uh, transition. Uh, the first call to action is to encourage or appeal to all of you, uh, first to build your capacity or your knowledge about secularity and try to put it into uh, action in whatever you are doing, in uh, the way you uh, dispose of your uh, food uh, leftovers, the way you uh, handle plastics and so on. Everybody has a role to play in that. And the second is that uh, as I said in my uh, remarks, I am looking at this uh, summit as a window that has been opened uh, for cooperation and collaboration. And I want us to take immediate action right after this event is over uh, to build the partnerships that we all need to ensure that we are transitioning to a secular economy in the country. Thank you. Venkat, the window is open. 
What's beyond that window? You have the last word. Perfect. I'm actually not going to just do a call to action, but also a few promises. Yeah. So before I do that, uh, Katie, if you have the slides up, can you go to the last but one slide? All right. Um, first thing is um, the last but one. Um, I want to first reciprocate to Oliver's thing about how we can work together. Um, you spoke about evidence-based action. You spoke about commonal, common platform for all stakeholders to come together. Um, I want to use this opportunity to talk about, I was speaking about CAIF, which focuses specifically on uh, fashion industry. But our partners and stakeholders, based on the work that we've done, have encouraged us to launch a similar initiative, which is active in Asia. And as of today, we want to bring in Circular Cities Initiative, which actually incidentally focuses on the same value chains, which is uh, textiles, plastics, electronic waste, and built environment. Good. So that's launched as of now. It's just a question of having partners, if you want to sign up, and how you want to uh, play a role. That's one. Second is everyone has a role. It only takes a conversation. So any time between this minute and 2.30 when I have to leave for the airport tomorrow, you feel like having a conversation, just an exploratory conversation on how we want to work together or how we can work together between the four speakers just here, and there's a lot more, I'll be open to a conversation any time between now and 2.30 tomorrow. And if you feel like you want me to extend the trip, I'm happy to extend the trip. <laughs> the third one is, um, I think it takes uh, a little bit of, reality check and knowing that we alone can't do it. So whether it is through Sankalp or IntelliCap, my home base is Asia, but my promise, and I think Oliver uh, and I've had this conversation three days back, is that my home base is Asia, but if we need to do this and if you need to do justice to helping scale circularity beyond what you're already doing and your thinking and actions are far more progressive than India and Bangladesh, and Asia has got so much to learn, and that's an honest opinion, is that you will see me with feet on the ground a lot more than just once in a year at Sankalp. That's my promise as well. So anything that takes, it's just a question of having a conversation, so feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm around uh, till 2.30 tomorrow before I leave for the airport. Just grab me and we'll have a conversation to figure out. Ladies and gentlemen, please a round of applause for my panelists, Mr. Oliver Boachi, Senior Advisor to the Minister of Environment, Science, Technology and Innovation, the Government of Ghana. We have also Ms. Abana Isumaning, Environmental Sanitation Consultant with many great hats. Mr. Kwame Asamwa Mensa Yosin, Ghana National Plastic Action, and last, definitely not the least, the newest Ghanaian in town, Mr. Venkat Kota Maraju Kwame. Maraju. Okay, from Entelecap. I give you a Kwame. You look like a Kwame. I'm absolutely fine with that. Which day were you Love born? That. Which day were you born? Uh, 2nd August, Saturday, I believe. So he's a... He's a Kwame. Ah, you look like a Kwame. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Kwame Venkat. And now I hand it back to my colleague, William, who will usher us into the rest of the day's schedule. Thank you. Thank you very much, panelists. Thank you as well to the, the panel members. I think it's been a very informative session, uh, very informative, you know, talking about uh, some of the work that is going into um, circular economics, uh, you know, the research going into it and the best practices. And uh, I think you've also mentioned um, something that was quite key that we wanted to also touch about, which was the Circular Cities Initiative. Um, so, I mean, reach out to uh, the IntelliCup team. We are happy to provide more information on that. Um, we also have, uh, I think, our mentions of the social media. So feel free to tweet, retweet, share, like, and also tag us uh, as you do your postings. Um, so I'd like to now welcome uh, my colleague, Kanika. Um, she's going to talk briefly about uh, one of the initiatives that we have uh, as IntelliCup. Thanks. Hello, good morning everyone. I hope you had a good start to the day. So as my colleague William mentioned, I'll just quickly mention about a very interesting initiative that we have recently launched. Okay, so what's the initiative about? So 
Comprehensive climate action cannot take place without the integration of the gender consideration in finance. So we have been hearing about the access to finance as a problem yesterday and over the work that we have been doing. And particularly this problem is much more for the women and particularly in the climate sector. So however, the financial systems and the instruments across the globe continue to remain inadequate in this aspect. Given this, the French Development Agency, Shakti Foundation, and Small Industries Development Bank of India have launched a first of its kind initiative, a network of greening of finance by women, or as we call it, GROW. It is uniquely positioned on the nexus of gender, climate, and finance. It aims to leverage the women's participation in leadership and knowledge to create a gender equitable green and climate finance sector. As IntelliCap, we are supporting the strategy and operationalization of this platform called as Grow. We invite all of you working in the green and climate finance sector and organizations to partner with us uh, under this GROW initiative and get the opportunity to collaborate and network through the various activities and events uh, of GROW. If you want to know further, uh, there is an email ID as well as the website that we have for the GROW. Please uh, uh, make note of that and reach out to us. It will be good to have all of you who are working at the intersection of the climate, gender, and finance to be a part of this initiative, learn more about this initiative, and contribute to the involvement of more gender, and mobilize that uh, capital into the climate sector. Thank you, and have a good rest of the day.